In terms of what I'm going to say this morning, um, I'm really conscious that I don't want to teach. Uh, there's such a lot of experience in this room. I don't want to go and uh, teach you to suck eggs. But um, And I'm also conscious that uh, New Zealand doesn't have the same context. And I uh, listen to Brendan. I mean, we haven't got that whole issue of youth homelessness in, in the extent that you have. Our homelessness is far more family orientated. And so a lot of my experience comes... Uh, out of that situation, um, and uh, I, 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 we we do have different contexts and history, and and uh, and different ways of approach. And until um, uh, um, Australia finally becomes the West Island of New Zealand, um, that's going to continue. Uh, but um, so, uh, like, treat what I'm saying this morning um, like eating fish. You know, just eat the stuff that's good and leave the bones. Um, and uh, let me, uh, but, but what I want to do this morning is, is really four things. I, I'd like to talk about my own sort of journey in terms of housing uh, and people who are homeless and, uh, and working with them uh, and, and sharing life with them. I'd like to reflect on some of the observations of that journey and then I'd like to sort of uh, talk a bit about uh, what I see as a situation going forward because I think housing crisis is actually happening all over the Western world and uh, what is actually occurring is part of a whole thing that's happening in economic, uh, as a result of economic liberalism. Um, over 30 years ago, the Salvation Army, uh, I was working in Wellington, which is our headquarters, and uh, I think really they didn't know what to do with me um, and but they thought that would be a good idea to get me as far away from Wellington as possible um, so uh, they uh, the opportunity came for me to go to the area which at that stage was the uh, neediest area in New Zealand which was South Auckland part of uh, our largest city um, in, uh, in many areas that you'll uh, think about in your own cities and in, in Adelaide an area of high need uh, low income people people really struggling a whole range of social problems and I got to go there and um, because the Salvation Army didn't have any work there they basically said to me look you go and find something to do and we'll keep paying you because I think it really was they were that desperate at that stage to get me out of Wellington um, and out of their hair so um, that's what I did and uh, I arrived in South Auckland and uh, I thought well where do you start what, what do you do when you when you, when you sort of arrive in an in a area of high need we were living in the middle of the uh, we, it got us a house in the middle of the uh, the most needy of those suburbs and uh, so I decided, well, you don't do anything. You just actually listen to people. And so that's what I did. I just uh, went around and I talked to people. I'd go and take my lunch into the, um, into the city, into the, uh, anywhere where there was people. I'd sit down and wait to see who came and talked to me. Or um, I'd, if people were sweeping the street or they were waiting for the bus or they were doing something, well, I would get into conversation. I'd get on buses and just sit down beside somebody and talk to them about what was happening, what did they think was happening uh, in the city and, and, and what were the issues. And now I talked, of course, to uh, the police, I talked to the mayor, and uh, I spent the three months just actually talking to people. And uh, over that time, I started to think about, well, what does this city look like? What does this area look like? When it is a socially just place, when it is the place that we would desire, what does it look like? How does its, how does its workplace look like? What does its transport look like? What does its housing look like? What are, what are people's lives look like? And I started to sort of chart that and in a sense paint a picture of what this community could look like. And... Um, and over the three months, that developed into a, into a fairly uh, a comprehensive picture. And then, in fact, I thought, well, now I know what I'm doing. I'm trying to actually make this picture a reality. And I guess 
in the last 30 years, because I'm still in that community now, um, I suppose that's what I've been trying to do. <laughs> um, at least I know that I'm painting on the picture. I think it's really important to know what the picture is, because otherwise you might be painting on another picture somewhere else, or you might be creating something else that's not really about social justice. So I think it's really important to know that picture, and uh, that's, in a sense, what I'm doing, what I've been doing. So as I started to converse, uh, have conversation with people, one of the things that came up over and over again was the pressure that people had with housing. And uh, I'd meet people, and they were in all sorts of environments, and, and I remember on... Uh, on one occasion, uh, talking to a woman on the bus, and she said, would you like to come and see where we live? And uh, I went to visit them, and they were in a six-by-four shed, and she had three little girls, and everything they owned was in shopping uh, um, supermarket bags on nails. And they weren't even able to use the toilets in the bathroom in the house. Um, they had to use the toilets and the bathroom in a park, which was about three doors down. And um, they were paying, at that stage, about $200, $250 a week for this six-by-four shed. And I guess it was impact of that woman and others that said to me, well, this is an area which I've got to try and, uh, and, and do something about. And so... Uh, we became involved in uh, firstly uh, um, providing some emergency housing, and they were really emergency houses because uh, they weren't single, uh, single occupiers of emergency housing. We put four families in each house. Um, now, I mean, you can imagine what, at, at, at the height of it, we had about 25 houses and uh, four families in each house. Um, uh, you know, uh, up, up to a sort of 100 families. And uh, the heroes were those people in those houses. I mean, they they just taught me so much that they could live with four other families. If you put me in a house with four other families and asked me to live there for any period of time, um, I would most probably be up before the court for murder or something. I mean, you know, like... It was fantastic what I actually saw. And um, so as I started to interact with these people in this situation, um, and particularly when we were providing emergency housing, and uh, it, exactly the same as, as what Brendan's just said, we, we would work like mad to find somebody a permanent house only to find there was five more families waiting to get into the one house that we had. And so that whole business of saying, you know, we're going to be in housing, we're going to provide uh, transitional housing, we're going to provide emergency housing, um, I soon realised that that was, a completely, that was a completely inadequate exercise, that I couldn't stop there, and that... Uh, something else needed to happen. So I guess over a period of time, um, in terms of where I was in housing and where I felt I needed to be and what I was being called to, it was a really a four-fold strategy. And, I, and in some senses, that strategy has been part of what I've been doing over the last, four, uh, the last 30 years. Um, the first part of the strategy was Yes, you've got to respond to the situations of people. Um, obviously, you've got to provide uh, emergency housing or transitional housing or whatever you've got to provide um, to take people out of the sort of pressure and the, the, the tragedy of the circumstances that they find themselves, whether they're young or old or whoever they are. Um, but then I thought, well, you actually need to do more than that. You need to provide advocacy for these people because they are often in situations where they're so traumatised by everything that's happening to them um, that they need advocacy. And so you need to have really good advocates. You really need to have people who are a really expert at actually getting through the systems and getting and moving these people in a way that actually will uh, move their situation forward. Um, 
the next thing I decided that needed to be part of the strategy was that there was no use just providing emergency and transitional housing. You actually needed to provide some real housing. You needed to, part of the problem was supply. Supply was getting smaller. There was, you know, like the, all the statistics were going in the wrong direction. And so you had all of these people, as, as Brendan is, is talking about, you know, there's wherever you go, all the numbers are going up and the number of permanent houses are getting less. So I needed to do something about that. And uh, this, the, the fourth area was that if something was really going to change, then it was going to be changing at a macro level. Uh, housing is uh, extraordinarily expensive and the most difficult, actually, of provisions you need to make. If you, if you decide you haven't got enough bread tomorrow, today, you just bake more bread and you bake the bread that's needed and you keep doing it every day. If you decide you haven't got enough houses, um, then it's 10 years before you can actually make that happen. And uh, so I thought we need to be involved at a political level. And so I suppose... In that reflection, that's been the agenda of my life since then. Those four things have been uh, the things that I've been um, involved in. Now, I, I, I don't want to spend a lot of time in sort of emergency and transitional shelter because I think uh, you've got a whole lot of experience in there. I'm not going to teach you anything, and there's nothing out of the New Zealand situation which I think is uh, is is all that clever. So I'm just going to jump over that. But I think, just to say that I think one of the things I've been working on in that area over a, in, a, in a variety of roles, I was responsible for the Social Services of Salvation Army for a, a period of time for New Zealand, Fiji and Tonga, and... Um, um, have been involved in the sort of delivery on our um, on our uh, housing board. One of the things that I suppose has been consistent that I feel that we, is that we've got to find ways of deepening the dignity and respect of people. And suppose I suppose that uh, I. I, I there is sometimes a tendency to feel, okay, we just need basic housing as long as we've got somewhere to put these people in. I think we've got to do more than that, and that's been one of the things that I've been working on over the years, is increasing the dignity and respect. In, in, in some senses, transitional and emergency housing, because of the very pressure those people are on, should be better. Um, and should be uh, should provide some sort of services that I think are, are good um, for those sorts of pressures on their life. And then in terms of the, so, but let me talk a bit about advocacy because I think advocacy is an area that we really need to be doing. For uh, I, one of the um, on one day I was uh, early on I was in my office and. Um, uh, we started on some advocacy programs, and one day I was sitting there, and the phone rang. I picked up the phone, and this guy said, "I'm the uh, uh, I'm the chief executive for Housing New Zealand, which is the major government agency." I said, "Oh, it's nice to talk to you. I was surprised that you've rung me." He said, "Well, he said we have lots of meetings with our housing staff throughout the country, uh, and particularly in Auckland." And he said, um, "Your name keeps coming up." I said, oh, that's good. Um, and he said, well, it's not so good really because he said it usually um, makes people angry and um, usually it's, uh, it, it's, it's not very polite about what they're saying about you. But he said, I reckon there must be another side to that story. So if I send you an air ticket, will you come to Wellington and tell me what the other side of that story was? And... Um, and I suddenly realised that advocacy does actually have a impact and people start to listen what's going on. Some of the advocacy that we've done uh, was, was simple things really. Uh, at that stage in New Zealand, um, tenancy law was very, very poor and uh, people, uh, would, if they were having a problem with their, uh, with their rental housing, then uh, all that would happen would be the, uh, the landlord would put all their stuff out on the road, and um, that would be it. 
Um, so we just started, we got to, I got together a group of people and uh, we had a service which people could, uh, could contact us about and if you were being moved out of your house um, by the landlord and uh, your furniture was being put out of the road, we turned up and we moved your furniture back in to the house. Um, and uh, we made it more and more difficult for landlords to uh, to move out. So that simple uh, piece of uh, of process uh, used to uh, meant that the media used to turn up because normally there was a bit of a conflict going on. There's quite a bit of shouting, and it was quite good television. And uh, but slowly it started to to bring more pressure and uh, we did see changes in, uh, I'm not saying it was the only case, but we, but New Zealand tenancy law changed quite significant. On another occasion um, I, was, uh, uh, I was working in my office and uh, some of the staff came in and said, look there's somebody here uh, who, who needs a food parcel and everybody's being... Uh, is busy and I was very busy doing the budget for THQ when really when you're doing the budget you don't really want to be disturbed and I was a bit annoyed you know I thought well don't they know that I'm doing really important stuff here and uh, anyway I went and uh, I thought well I can quickly give this person a food parcel and that'll be it and we started to have a conversation and I realised there's something something said to me keep this conversation so uh, Megan saying about keep talking keep listening and that's what I had to do that that morning. And as I listened, I found a very a very pa- uh, painful story of this family who um, they actually had their own house, um, and uh, they'd managed to scrape this house together. Um, he was working a very uh, ordinary job, um, but the factory had moved from one side of Auckland to the other and uh, he couldn't do it in public transport so he had to buy a vehicle. He'd gone along and somebody said, yes, we'll sell you a vehicle. He didn't have any money. We'll, no trouble, we'll sell you a vehicle. Um, we just need to take a mortgage over your house. And so they took a mortgage or another second mortgage over the house and um, the, uh, uh, they, they'd had the car for about a, a, a week and the car blew up and uh, um, then they wouldn't fix it and uh, a whole lot of things happened. And So he was telling me this story and he said, my house is going to be sold this afternoon. And I realised, well, a food parcel is not really going to fix this. So I rang up some of my colleague officers and other people and said, we're off to an auction sale this afternoon. So we went to the auction sale and we sat in the front row. And it was a very sort of upmarket auction house in Auckland. And um, we sat in the front seat and uh, eventually the house came up. And just as it was coming up, I stood up and said, look, I just would like to give you a bit of background about this house. And I just told the story that he had told me. Well, the uh, auctioneer was a bit unsure what to do. The manager, uh, <laughs> the manager came in and they were, had a bit deep conversation. And just at that moment through the back door, because I'd also rung the TV, they came in and uh, so the company decided that they didn't want to sell the house that day. Uh, and uh, it was withdrawn and uh, a whole lot of things happened as a result of that. The, f- the family stayed in their house, uh, the uh, television company, we have a program called Fair Go, they started to investigate the sale of those cars and uh, some law change came about the sa- about being able to take uh, second mortgages over houses and all sorts of, and I thought again advocacy. The opportunity to do little things and just listen to people sometimes and instead of giving them uh, the, the sort of, uh, it's about taking some other things. Then uh, an, another thing that, uh, that happened in that regard was, you know, so there was lots of, lots of little things. I mean, on another occasion, we, uh, the, um, the government put a freeze on rents. And they didn't make any difference at all to people's ability to get houses. And so we took, uh, we went round to the, to the to, uh, Redshield thrift shop, we got an old freezer and we took it and put it in the front of the, um, of the Housing New Zealand office and with a big sign on, uh, this freeze is not working. Uh, and uh, again, invited the TV and, uh, and uh, so I think it's about finding creative ways 
to actually bring the, uh, the, the, the needs of people. And it's exactly what Brendan's doing. Um, bring, use creative ways to actually uh, establish the issue. Um, the, um, the, the, uh, the, set, the third area was the area of trying to do something about um, bringing people into housing. And for me, that's been a number of things. I was able to uh, sit down with one of the large philanthropic uh, organisations in New Zealand and say, look, something needs to happen about getting people into housing. And uh, um, I couldn't actually talk the Salvation Army into it. They saw all sorts of fish hooks in it. So I thought, well, we're going to do it anyway. So um, we set up a, another a community uh, organisation called the New Zealand Housing Foundation. And um, it's been a really interesting journey. But, but at this stage, we've now built um, about a thousand houses in New Zealand um, for people. Um, we've used mostly a shared equity and a rent to buy uh, process so that people buy 60 or 70 percent of their house instead of having to buy the whole 100 um, percent. Been, they, they buy 65 or 60 percent if they can and then over a period of time um, as their situation improves um, we've, we freeze the cost at the cost that it co costs us to build it when they build it and then they get equity gain and then of course they're able to get more mortgage and uh, eventually, so? No, the Salvation Army decided it was too risky to do so we set up another, another organisation to do that but uh, now I think they wish they were doing it but uh, that's, you know, that's how it happens. Um, the, uh, Another situation which I did talk the army into doing was uh, a group of people came to me and said uh, we want to set up a, fa a, ha a factory which will build prefabricated housing and, um, it will, uh, and we'll get families to come and work together. Um, and uh, so uh, I managed to get the army to put up at that stage which was uh, uh, the, the money for the first six houses. Um, and um, they did that and uh, we built those first six houses with the families working together in the factory um, helping to establish these panels under sort of supervision and uh, so people actually built their own houses. Now that's, that process is still going on too. Um, the army, I think often we don't need to keep doing these things because we start them off, get them going and then other people move in and, and fund them. So um, I, I think that way of actually getting people in into home ownership and into uh, homes of their own, finding ways. I was also part of the uh, establishment of Habitat for, uh, for Humanity in New Zealand, again. Um, so I think it's finding ways in which we can stop moving just the sort of in the, uh, in the helping space, if you like, the temporary space, but also into the permanent space. And then the... Um, the, the, the level of political involvement. I think political involvement often comes when you start to advocate and you start to get a bit of a reputation in the media or in situations. The politicians suddenly become very interested in you because um, you don't need to go along and ask them to talk to you. They want to talk to you because you are creating a bit of a nuisance for them. Um, in the in the situation, um, and um, so uh, that that happened early on. I would have politicians uh, uh, arguing with me on uh, television and a number of other places. And I remember on one um, particular situation, um, uh, sitting down with a, a, a nationwide on nationwide TV program, and the. Um, and the interviewer said to me, I think we can pretty much change the policy here. And the Minister of Housing on the other side. And um, that story goes on and on because people now say that I destroyed the career of that, uh, of that Minister of Housing because he just 
would not admit there was a change in housing. It actually was a point in which housing did change. He was dismissed as the Minister of Housing, another minister came in and things started to change. Now that's a sort of more dramatic. But uh, over the years what I found is that working in government, um, uh, a while, uh, five years ago I had a phone call and it was the Minister of Finance and he said look we're going to have a major crisis in Auckland in housing in six or seven years. We need to rethink uh, how housing's being done. And so uh, we would like you to be part of a group that actually does that. Now that had come out of, I suppose, years of not being all that popular and advocate, advocating and, and media, I think using the media, raising the need for stories and those sorts of things. So uh, in a political level, I've had that opportunity of being part of the ha uh, Housing Shareholders Advisory Group. Uh, um, I was asked to write the housing papers for the Royal Commission on Social Policy. I've been chair of the National Housing Strategy. Um, I've, uh, uh, I've been on other various working parties and groups um, for government. So I think that what I'm trying to say is that as uh, people who are doing a top work as you are in the, um, in the uh, field of housing, that don't forget how powerful your influence is. Don't forget that um, part of what's happening, sorry, my notes have disappeared here, but I'll try and get them back. Um, don't forget the power that you've got. Um, you've got a lot of money coming in from government, but you've also got a lot of influence in terms of the model that you're doing, the things that you're doing, because you're doing them really well. And uh, so I just encourage you to take that, uh, that further. One of the most, uh, and I talked a little bit about it yesterday, one of the uh, most uh, impacting things we've done is set up the social policy unit. And that really came out a bit after um, because uh, I'd been working in the area. Um, it, had, um, it had started to develop and uh, I had this whole idea of the fact that the Salvation Army should have a unit which was speaking about the important social justice units area of the country. And um, funny how these things come out of conflict, but um, again, um, I managed to get myself um, uh, offside with the, um, with the territorial commander when I was a divisional commander. Um, and uh, we came to a parting of the ways, and he said, "Well, what are you going to do? You can't. I can't demote you to be a uh, when you're a divisional commander." And so I said, "Well, uh, I've got an idea that you might be interested in." And uh, I told him about the social policy, and he was so grateful to have something that uh, looked like I wasn't being disciplined, but. Uh, in fact, I was, and uh, but it was exactly what I wanted to do. And so uh, this is where we end up in South Auckland, uh, in the area of highest need, um, uh, with a, a social policy unit, um, which, as I said to you yesterday, has uh, just a small group of people who are really looking at areas. And, and what we are trying to do there is to say we are representative of the voices of people who are coming in our programs. We are their voice. So we don't, as an instance, we don't, uh, if the Salvation Army wants to talk about taxation, we don't get involved in that. If the Salvation Army is wanting to do something to talk to government about their own services, we don't do that. We only talk about things which are part of our clients and part of the people that we're working with. And uh, so over the period of time, we've done a lot in housing. We've now done, I think, about 14 or 15 reports uh, on various a aspects of housing, just to give you some idea of what those uh, look like. Um, we had a, a report called a house, a house or a Home, the housing aspirations of people. So we talked to people about what their aspirations were for housing and uh, published that report. 
um, a home I could own, ways to develop home ownership. So we sat down with people and said, how could you get, what are the blocks that are stopping you from getting into home ownership? And then we suggested some ways around that. And we suggested a national savings scheme, which is actually now uh, we have KiwiSaver in New Zealand. Now, we're, again, we're you're very rarely the only people talking about that at any one time. You can't sort of say, oh, well, we created that. But you're part of the discussion and the debate. Um, we had another report called Forgotten People, The Plight of Homeless uh, Men. Uh, we had another called Beyond the Kiwi Dream, which was a national plan to get rid of homelessness. Um, and uh, a whole lot of, uh, of reports that we've done. And so in some senses, what we've now become is the Army has become the go-to organisation if you want to talk about housing. And the army has become the go-to organisation that the government feels they must consult with around housing issues. In fact, an interesting thing happened earlier this year. Um, one of the uh, because it's not that we don't continue, we don't annoy government every now and again. And there was a deputy uh, minister of housing who who was a bit annoyed by what one of our particular staff members. Uh, 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 who's is really an expert in housing, um, was saying, and um, and saying on the media. So, in what he thought was a private uh, national party conference, he got stuck into the Salvation Army and to this particular person. What he didn't know was that the television uh, was there and actually reported his statement. Well. It hadn't come on television an hour when he was ringing me deeply apologetic for uh, what he had said. And I realised he wasn't ringing because he felt it was a good idea. He was being ringing because he was being told to ring. And it turned out that the Prime Minister then made a public apology and, uh, and um, we were able to to uh, uh, win a few more points in terms of, of housing policy. So what I'm saying is that it is possible, I think, to take the work that you're doing and turn it into some really powerful uh, political action. And we don't do it for the sake of the Salvation Army, we do it for the sake of the people that we're, uh, we're working for and articulating their issues, bringing their issues up. And uh, I, I think uh, the sorts of things that, um, that are happening. How are we going for time, Mum? We need to stop, do we? Three minutes, okay. Well, I'm a quarter away through what I was going to say. So, <laughs> <laughs> okay. So let me just give you some observations in terms of that. Um, I think observations that I'd make around my journey then in housing is the necessity of being involved in provision, advocacy, and policy level of housing. I don't think we should be involved in just one area. I think we need to be involved, and there are different ways of doing that, but we need to, to do that. People give us the opportunity to, when they come to our services, whether they're young people, whether they're families, they give us the opportunity to intervene in their lives at one of the most fundamental and vulnerable points of their living as human beings. And so there is, as we already said this morning, there's an immense privilege in working with people, but I think there's an immense responsibility also when people share their lives in really difficult circumstances. And I think what they're saying to us, whether they're young or whether they're families, they're saying to us, I'm, I'm willing to accept and I'm very grateful for your help. But please stop that which is dehumanizing me and what is disempowering me from continuing to happen to all sorts of people. If what we are doing is we are simply every time taking the same situation and repeating it over and over and over again and never trying to actually change that situation, then I think there's a question about that. Um, that we need to ask ourselves. If we continue to, not, to only provide um, an emergency response, we deny the importance of shelter and people being part of community and of well-being. Uh, we need to be wary, I think, when the government funds us to get people off the street into temporary accommodation. Now, what I'm finding in New Zealand is the government's putting more and more and more money into 
uh, temporary responses. We are now spending an enormous amount of money in temporary responses. And I'm keeping raising the issue that that's good in one hand, but it's difficult in another. Because those temporary responses are not really helping the long-term situation. Um, I think the Salvation Army is in a position to create positive progress for vulnerable people. Um, and uh, I, I, in our, uh, through political change. And some of the things that I would see that we have been able to do, we've been able to create, uh, we've, we've, some of our work has led to the creation of better systems for managing housing nationally. We've put housing back to a central place in the political agenda of some parties. Our present government wouldn't have talked at all about housing a few years ago. And we've been able to put it on the centre stage. So they now feel, even though they're a more conservative government, they do, feel, they do know they can't ignore housing. Um, we've, uh, uh, we, we've had a huge inflict on on some political parties, in fact a frightening influence I might say, um, because we had a, a, a visit on one occasion from the Labour Party spokesperson on housing and uh, he said, uh, look we, we don't really know what to do in the future. And they said, oh, well, we said, well look, sit down, we'll, we'll, we'll share some ideas. So we spent two hours sharing ideas about how you could actually do that and basically it was about a national building program which was funded by low interest money which is available to governments at this stage um, like it's never been available before and, uh, and, and, and investing in that way. And a um, couple of weeks later um, uh, the the leader of the opposition announced this new housing program which seemed remarkably like what we'd been talking about. And uh, so uh, we met with the, ha with the, minister, with the uh, leader of the opposition housing spokesman again and, he said, and I said, oh, we're very pleased to hear your, your ideas. He said, oh, well, you know where they came from. He said, it came from our meeting. And I thought, well, we were scrabbling things on the back of an envelope and here they are announcing it as national policy. I think one of the things we need to realise is that often our experience on the ground and the things that we know about housing are a lot more than sometimes politicians know. So don't be shy about sharing some of the stuff that, uh, that we do know. Um, and housing is certainly on our, immediate, uh, our media agenda. I think housing is a place from where ministry can develop and build. One of the things that uh, I think it's, it's in some sense is turning our, we, we had a, we've always had a traditional approach of um, uh, starting us, of having a sort of Salvation Army core and then finding what sort of services we can um, offer out of those core. I think increasingly we're saying if we, work in an area like housing and we start working in that area and, and actually that is a ministry in itself. And then out of that springs a whole lot of other things. So it's, it's reversing what's happening. Listen, I'll stop there, as I say, um, and uh, there'll be plenty of opportunity.